finding your spiritual gift. You know, it's interesting. Um, we've got so many movies on superheroes. You may have seen some of them. And I asked the question to somebody the other day, who's your favorite superhero? Now there's Marvel's lineup. And you can pick, those are all superheroes. And so many of the movies are about superheroes. I actually got Carolyn to go with me this weekend to see the Guardians of the Galaxy. Are we the only ones that have seen that? Apparently the nation has seen it. And and if you want to see something that's really unusual, you've got a genetically engineered talking raccoon, who's a superhero, and a tree that's a killer tree. And so anybody who's seen it knows what I'm talking about. But when it comes to superheroes, I like something nice and practical, like Superman. When I was a kid, uh, now that's, that's, that's a superhero to me. Yes. Uh, you know, and even as a kid, I, also, I always had this dreadful fear of something called kryptonite. You know, if there was kryptonite around, I didn't want to be around it. I thought it would take away my powers. But here's a little known secret about Superman. I think you ought to know this. His powers weren't real. He's not real. Okay, do you realize that? He's not real. But uh, here's another fact, however. The powers that I have and you have are real. They're not natural. They're not talents. They are supernatural. We have powers that the world can only dream about. Now, what are they? We possess a supernatural empowerment, if you will, an empowerment that cannot be explained in natural terms. And this power, the fuel source, is the Holy Spirit, the forgotten God, if you will, He empowers us in a way that is hard for us to even understand. That's why, according to Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Because we're told if we have the Spirit, we have Christ. And God says, you can do all things because, not because you're really talented, but because you have Christ in you. Now, let me give you some more facts. Fact number three or one, depending on how you're counting it, the Holy Spirit is God. Now, we've, this is a little review. In the previous two sessions, we saw, number one, that the Holy Spirit is God. And number two, the Holy Spirit, who is God, by the way, dwells inside each believer. And Luke recorded a promise from Jesus in chapter 24, and he said, Jesus said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And you want to talk about Superman's cloak. I've got a cloak which I'm clothed with power from on high. God never intended us to do the work he laid out for us without that power. Now, 1 Corinthians 6.19 gets it even a little deeper. Here's what it says. Don't you know... That your bodies, and it's talking plural, it's individuals, your bodies are temples or dwelling places of the Holy Spirit who is in you, just in case you didn't get the imagery, whom you have received from God. So, I take that to mean exactly what it says. That my body, me, I am a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit who is in me, whom I have received from God, but we also know that the Holy Spirit is God. And so I've got the fullness of God within me. Now, we've talked about some of the stuff already, but let me just review it real quickly about the mysteries of the Holy Spirit and what he provides. And let me just rattle these off quickly. This is from a previous two sermons. Number one, he helps you understand the mysteries of God. It's the Holy Spirit that brings this book alive. And number two, he intercedes for you in your prayers. When you don't know how to pray, he, he, he goes before God with groanings that cannot be uttered or understood by us. Number three, he opens doors of opportunities, but he also closes doors that he doesn't want us to go through. He's sort of leading us through life. Number four, he protects you in your battle against evil, especially when Satan and his legions attempt to destroy what a church is doing or what you as an individual are doing. I continue to caution us that we are on the radar screen for Satan now. And he will do things at this church to try to slow us down. Satan knows the potential of this church better than most of us do. Okay? 
But the Holy Spirit is there to help us. Number five, he gives you comfort and peace in times of sorrow. We talked about that. And he makes the unexplainable happen in your life. When things just cannot be explained, it's the Holy Spirit that is orchestrating it. And lastly, he reveals, we saw, God's will for us. He's sort of like a GPS in your car. If you're driving down to San Diego, you've got that sweet lady's voice that everybody knows so well telling you, turn right at the next light. And if you don't do it, what happens? She recalibrates, even though we've messed up, we missed a turn, she says, okay, now, here's what I want you to do. She never loses her temper. She never loses her cool. She just takes you where you are. And we are reminded that the Holy Spirit directs us through life and When we mess up, he cleans up our messes. And you say, well, he can't use me anymore. I'm I'm so lost in this world. He said, oh, I know where you are, and I know where you need to go. And with calm assurance, he leads us to the next step. He redirects our messes. But there's more. And today we're going to look at not the gift, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift God gave us. But now we're going to look at the individualized spiritual gifts which the Holy Spirit provides the power for. Now, first thing I'd like to say is God has given each of us, each of you, a supernatural gift. As I said, the Holy Spirit is the gift from God, but you also have specialized spiritual gifts. One of the greatest verses, underline this in your Bible, is 1 Peter 4.10. And we're going to use this as our primary verse today. Here's what it says. Each one should use whatever gift He has received to serve others. Now, it's not talking about the gift, the Holy Spirit, but it's talking about specialized gifts because each one has a little bit different one. He should use whatever gift he has received to do what? To make himself famous? To make himself happy? No, it says to serve others. That is the purpose of the gifts. Faithfully administering God's gift or grace in its various forms. Now, we're not talking about talents. Now, I was a school superintendent for a while, and we would, all the schools would like to brag about how smart their kids are and how talented. And one of the big things, and there's so many trends that come and go in schools, was the gifted and talented programs. And you would brag about how many kids you had in there. Well, let me just say there are talents, but I'm not talking about talents this morning. On the platform, we had some talented people that are musically talented. That's not a spiritual gift, but it's a great talent. Some of you, I know, in the past and even to this day, are very talented athletes. Some things came very naturally to you, but that's not a spiritual gift. There are others that I, I can't draw. I've got my, my, uh, some of my relatives are so gifted in drawing and painting. I've got none of that. I've got none of it. And theirs just came, raised in the same environment, but they have the talent. I don't understand it. But that's not a spiritual gift. Unlike talents, when it comes to spiritual gifts, nobody here has been missed. Every one of you has got a spiritual gift from God. Every one of you. And we have, been attempt, we have been challenged by God to attempt great things. And God delights in showing what he can do with common people. Now, if we had a group of superstars here that were so rich, so talented, so well-connected, they had fame and fortune, and we did a bunch of stuff, the world would say, wow, those people really were talented, rich, and famous, and, and smart. But when God uses ordinary people, and he accomplishes great things, the glory goes to him. And the spiritual gifts are supposed to be used not for our fame and glory or success, but for God's Son, Jesus Christ, to be exalted. God delights in doing that. So, we see each one of you has a spiritual gift. Number two, the purpose of your spiritual gift, I know this sounds like I'm repeating, is to serve others. So you've got a gift. You say, what is my gift? Hang on, and we'll get to it. The purpose, back to 1 Peter 4.10. Each one should use whatever gift he has received, here it is, to serve others. You say, I already saw that. 
faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So the purpose, the primary purpose, the core purpose is to serve others. And let me just add that it starts here inside this warm building. Okay? Starts here. One of the things that I believe as I, as I speak with these other pastors and church leaders uh, in a couple of weeks will be you have to start where you are and you have to figure out as a small church, what can you do better than everybody else? And I'll tell you one thing a small church ought to do and often misses is they need to take better care of each other. They need to take care of the body of Christ. And each member needs to use their gifts to serve the rest of the people in this body. You're going to hear something about a thing called life care a little bit later and a whole lot more about it next week. And this is one of the things we're going to do. You're going to see it on your screen real soon in a couple of weeks about taking care of the needs of each other. That's where it starts. To have a family that is so attractive and so in love with each other that people on the outside says, adopt me in, bring me in, I want to be there. Now, verse 11 of of 1 Peter 4. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Now, I've got a gift that involves speaking. And, and, And when I do it, I'm very committed to not speaking my own opinion, but speaking the word of God. And I believe that's one of the primary things I need to do. And if anyone serves, many of you have a serving gift, he or she should do it with the strength that God provides. Notice God provides the strength so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And again, the gifts serve each other with the purpose that God, the Son, Jesus Christ, will be praised. And to him, he says, be the glory and the power forever and ever. And Peter gives a big amen. In other words, I'm sealing this deal. Now, people say, well... When did I get this spiritual gift? That's a good question. I've grappled with that, and whether it's lying dormant in you or whether when you get saved it's given to you. If the Holy Spirit is empowering it, it seems like at salvation, when He comes inside your life and He lives in you, that He brings that gift with Him. And, and, and sometimes the gift isn't energized until sometime after your salvation or at salvation, lying dormant there. Now, there are some real surprises If we look at people and we say, my goodness, we look at some of the kids that have come through this ministry of this church, and you say, where did that come from? And you see them using such extraordinary gifts. You say, how'd that happen? How'd that happen? I know there are some real surprises. I believe I'm an example of a surprise. I come from a family that didn't have preachers. I come from a family of, of quiet, shy Dutch people, and I just... There was something inside of me that I knew after I got saved, I had to pronounce the truth of God. And I'd never done it. I'd never done it. And nobody in my family had. And so, and I got brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins, and yet I knew that's what I had to do. And God takes us down a lot of different paths to get us where He wants us. And He finally did. And, and when I got up, I learned that you know, the Holy Spirit was using me. I could feel it. I would get done preaching and say, man, that was really good. Did I just do that? And so when I look at it, I don't take any credit for it. Because God said, Rick, I'm entrusting you with this gift, and someday you're going to have to give an account for how you used it. And let me mention that every one of you will also. So the stakes are high here. God has given you a gift, He expects you to use it to bring glory to God and to serve others, and he will give an accounting for it or ask you for it. Number three, you may need to stir up your gift. Uh, See, I'm a big believer that every church has enough gifts in it. When I talk to these churches that are in a rut, they they talk about mega churches. Mega churches are, are, you know, they're important, and they do a valuable job. But only... Only 2% of the churches in America are megachurches, or churches of a 1,000 or more even. And the vast majority of them, 80%, are like 100 people. And as I talk to these guys, 80% of the pastors I need to talk to are struggling through these things and wondering whether they have enough gifted people in their church. And my answer is yes. First Tim- or 2 Timothy 1.6 
For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. It's like getting a campfire going. You see the embers down there. You know there's heat. You know there's a spark. And you got a big fan and you're just fanning it. You're trying to throw oxygen on it. When, when we don't use our gifts, churches suffer. When we don't use the gift that God has given you, you suffer. You, you, you feel your ineffectiveness. Some of you, you, you're frustrated. You don't know what your gift is. Or you know what it is and you haven't been using it. Or you haven't found a venue to use it. And that's where our church has to figure out a way to provide venues. Or you're burned out. Or you're bored or you lack joy, you just aren't using that supernatural empowerment. And you know from history that when you do use that gift, you're lit up. You know that you are alive and you feel it, and you never tire of it. Number four. Well, let me me stop there. I mentioned life care. Life care. You know, we've got a lot of lives now. We've got life groups, we've got life care, and we could go on. Because we are life point. What is the point of life? Well, one of them get in small groups. Another is to care for each other. And life care will be primarily to take care of the family here. We've got, uh, oh, I don't want to miss anybody on this, but I know Nancy Smith and Donna and Doris have all been involved in helping to put this together. And they've got a team that you're going to hear about next week where, where you have somebody that works with Uh, If somebody in this body needs transportation or they're a shut-in and they need special help or if they just need a visit or if there's a funeral coming up that they step in and, and if there's baptisms, they work with the people on baptisms and that we try to remember uh, the sunshine aspects of our body like birthdays and anniversaries and babies being born. We are small enough and no church ever gets too big to forget these that people need to have those special moments memorialized. And we've got a group of people that's forming, and they'll have, a, I think, a table out there next week and a whole list of this stuff where you can... So many of you have the gift of serving or of mercy or of encouragement and how to use those gifts to serve the rest of the body. We believe we need to take better care of this body. That's the starting point. And we need to be the best at doing it. Well, let me go on a bit. You'll hear more about that next week. Number four, there's a minimum weariness and maximum of effectiveness when you exercise your spiritual gift. And might I say that the reverse is true. If I try to exercise somebody else's gift, it isn't going to work. I'm going to get tired. Now, I used to brag about the fact that I could walk on my hands. Okay? You say, are you going to put on a demonstration right now? Not unless you come up here and help me do it and do it yourself. I used to be able to do it. And, but, and I was pretty good at it. I don't know exactly how far I, I could go, but I'll tell you this. We've got a one-year-old that lives in our house. And that one-year-old can go further and faster on two feet than I can ever do on two hands. And I would put him up against anybody right now on two hands. Why? Because feet were made for walking and not hands. And when we use our gifts properly, it seems like you can go on forever. Because in 1 Peter 11, or 4.11, it says, with the strength that God provides. See, it's not about you, it's about God. He provides the strength. I love to declare the truth of God. I never tire of it. I could do it morning, noon, and night. The more, the better. I love to do it. There are other areas, if you were to put me in charge of them, I'd be tired in a heartbeat because it's not my area of giftedness. Number five, the ministry of this church is hindered when just one person fails to use their gift. You say, you got any Bible verses for that? Yeah, I sure do. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. You ever have a stubbed big toe? It makes walking difficult. The pain is with, if you have one part of your body, you have a toothache, and there's nothing right with your day when the tooth hurts. You have something else that's broken, and and many of you have gone through physical trauma. We all do. It's just a question of when and where. Then the rest of the body suffers. And when it comes to the church, when one person doesn't use the gift that God has given them, 
the whole church suffers. You say, well, but the church seems to be doing okay anyhow. Yeah, but it's not doing as okay as it could have been if everybody used their gifts. And that's why I believe every church, when I got here, you guys have all the gifts necessary. You do. You say, well, how do you revitalize the church? You've got to go out and bring a whole lot, lot of people in. Oh, they'll come, but it starts with the people. You have to convert the converted <laughs> and to show them that God wants to use them. And they may have used their gifts in the past and become frustrated and then tried it again and gotten frustrated again. But what I'd like to say is you still get up off the floor and you do it again. You do it again. Because God is someday going to say, how did you use them? Well, let me mention another one. Number six, you shouldn't be jealous of someone else's gift. Now, there are some people that get jealous of the pastor. He gets all the microphone time, all the stage time. You know, I didn't ask for it. But this is what, I'm not good at much of anything else. You know, as people said, if this is what you're good at, you might not be good at anything else. But do what you feel God has empowered you to do. Gifts are given to God according to His volition, and his purposes, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. He gave you your gift because that's the way he wanted it. End of discussion. Now, God sees the big picture. He provides every church with all of the essential elements. Our job is to light those fires and get them going. One of the things that I have found in my leadership style is you have seen us taking people from this church and seeing them move to positions of leadership in this church. I know Leonard and Burl and Sharon and Sherry, who were at our previous church, first church, they know that we, we, one of the things we did is took guys and gals from our church and made them members of our staff. Because God had gifted them, and we just saw them grow. And, and what I like to do, my style is, give somebody a job and then get out of their way. And so many times pastors want to micromanage quality, competent people. People don't like to be micromanaged. Did you know that? And if God has laid a passion on their heart, one of the things I do is I'm their cheerleader, man. Go get it. Just make sure we're all headed the same direction. Just make sure we don't miss our mission. Our mission is to go out and make disciples in this world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is God. Don't forget that. So this is a place where you can grow your gift. I spoke with somebody within the last week from another church. Frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. Such a competent guy. But every time he tries to move forward to expand a certain area of ministry, he hits roadblocks from the leadership of the church. And I'm scratching my head and I'm saying, man, come on over here. Uh, Come on over here, man. Just use what God has got and we'll give you free reign. And if you're here this morning and you've got an idea, a, a, a passion, a leading to do a ministry, you come and see me. Come and see me. We'd like to turn you loose. Well, sometimes we get jealous of other people's gifts. Other times we get jealous of other, other churches. And you say, wow, look at all the rich people they have. You just need to know, God doesn't need rich people. Did you know that? Now, if he has blessed you and made you rich, more power to you. But God doesn't look at a church and say, well, they, I, I put a lot of rich people there so they can do my mission. He doesn't do it that way. He gives just the right amount of gifts. And we don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing. What we have to do is do what God is calling us to do. And our goal is to start here in Fallbrook and reach our city. That's where we start, making disciples. And we've seen certain things starting to pop up and bud, and I I praise God for that. You say, well, all right, you're going to tell me what my gift is, or you're going to make me come back next week. Well, let me go through some gifts, and I'm going to make a statement. Number seven, there are seven primary spiritual gifts. You say, well, that sounds pretty cut and dried. Uh, You know, it's not as cut and dried as it sounds. God, God is God, and even though from Romans 12, 
we can say, here are seven. God certainly, you need to know this, God has the right to add nuance. God can do that. And we may not be able to understand it and say, well, there are seven primary, and, and so well, that one doesn't fit. Well, let's let God worry about that. Here's what we do know from Romans chapter 12. It says in verse 6, here we go. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us, grace given us. So, we all have different gifts, and now in Romans, Paul is going to list those. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him do it in proportion to his faith. If it is, number two, serving, let him, and you need to read him or her, serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. All of these are him or her things. If it is encouraging, let him or her encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of the others, and by the way, that's a gift everybody wants. <laughs> I want to be rich so I can give money away. Uh, let him give generously. If it is leadership or administration or ruling, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, I spoke briefly on this when we did the rain dance series. So some of you say, I've heard some of this. Yeah, you've heard some of it. Let me add something else to it, though. Each Christian has one of these seven gifts. These gifts are permanent. You don't get a new one after 10 years. You don't have a place where you can go in and swap it. They're given, it appears, at salvation. They don't define or limit your area of service. There are pastors with the gift of mercy. There are pastors with the gift of prophecy. There are pastors with the gift of encouragement. There are pastors with the gift of teaching. I can go through and show you how each one of these can be used in the pastorate, as an elder, as a teacher of children, in any ministry, in Awana, wherever you want to put them. All of these can be done in those settings. Uh, for example, and, and by the way, each one of us, now listen to this one, don't miss this, if you say, well, my gift is the gift of serving, I don't have to do the other ones. I'm not saying that. Because if you go through the Bible, and I won't give all the verses, but every one of these I have proof text, if you will. And here's what I would have to say. We are all told to declare the truth, 1 Corinthians 14.1. We are all told to serve, Colossians 3.23. We are all told to teach in one way or another, we are all told, according to Hebrews 3.13, to be an encouragement to others. We are all told to give, not just the people with the gift of giving. We are all told to give to the work of the Lord. We are all told to be involved with leadership, ruling, administration. And we are all told, according to God's word, to display mercy to those that are in need of mercy and compassion. So we're to do all of those. But having said that, there are some people that are superstars when it comes to that you will find one more enjoyable and more productive. I'm going to do this. I did it before, but it's the easiest way for me to explain how to feel what you have. And I, and I drew the analogy of going to visit somebody in the hospital, a dear friend that's in the hospital. And if you looked at the seven gifts, here's how they might be manifested. Uh, I have, I call it the gift of prophecy or declaring truth. And there's some question is, does that mean new revelation or the declaration of current revelation? Here's what we do know. It is declaring, thus saith the Lord, God's revealed truth. And I might go in, and who do we want to put in the hospital? We'll go visit Jerry. How's Jerry? We'll go, Jerry, you don't mind going to the hospital for us, do you? All right. I might go in and say, you know, Jerry, I warned you, man, if you just kept eating those burritos and tacos and all of this, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, you've seen it going up. And Jerry, here, let me show you where I warned you about this. You need to stop. You need to stop. Here's what you need to do to make it right. That's how Jerry's probably not going to want my visit, okay? There are others that might come in with the gift of serving. And they may come in and say, you know, Jerry, let me take, we'll pretend Jerry has kids now. <laughs> Young kids, you do have kids. Well, let me take care of your kids, and, and, and by the way, I watered your trees, and I took care of the dog while you're in the hospital, and, and let me bring some meals into you. What can I do to help you? 
The jury's going to want to see that person. There are some with the gift of teaching. And Jerry's got some condition, and they bring in a bunch of books. Jerry, I've been doing a lot of reading on the internet and on these books, and, and here's what I believe is, is going on. And I think if you really study here, uh, you'll find here's what needs to be done, here's the type of doctor you need, and, and let, me, let me just work you through this. Can I, can I just sit down with you and work? And there are some people that just love to teach like that. Whereas the guy with declaration of the truth is saying, here's where you went wrong. <laughs> you know, and, well, I, I try not to do it quite that harshly. And now nobody's going to want me to visit him in the hospital, right? No, I'm, I, I'm, I've learned how to be compassionate. It doesn't come real easily, but, but uh, well, sometimes those that declare the truth have trouble with that. But then there's the person with encouragement. You know, Jerry, I've, I've had some other friends that have gone through this, and, and, and I'll tell you something, you'll get through it. And it's a year later, and uh, those of you that have rotator cuff surgery, look at me, I can raise my arms again, and other people. And so, you know, I've been through it, you'll be just fine. They have the gift of encouragement. And then there's the person with the gift of giving. They leave, and the next day, the, the hospital administration comes up and said, by the way, that person that was here paid your bill. They didn't want you to know. And also, they may say, hey, you know, I know you're going to be out of work for a while, uh, you know, I've, I've got a little something I'd like to give you that might help. They've got the gift of giving. They just spot needs intuitively. They know when somebody needs something. And then there's the person with the gift of leadership. He or she comes in and said, you know, I've organized all the women of the church, and here's the schedule for the next five weeks. Here's when your meals will come. Here's when somebody will ride, take you to the doctor. And by the way, while I was over there lining things up, I noticed you had an electrical problem in your house, and I've got an electrician coming in Monday, and, you know, and things like that, plumber on Tuesday, and so forth. And then the last one, the dear people with mercy. Oh, they're wonderful. They come in, and they say, you know, Jerry, I know you're hurting, and I'm going to stay here with you as long as it takes. I'll just be here for you. They may not talk, they may not do anything. They just are there because they sense, I've got somebody that needs help, needs mercy. Wow. Now, I'm going to guess each one of you has a, one of those that is dominant in you. So let me take it one more direction, and I'm going to show you what happens when a person abuses the gift they have. Now, oftentimes, it's easier to see your gift by your abuses. So hang on to this one. The person with prophesying, remember we said that's declaring the truth? One of the pa problems pastors have is they think because they are able to very capably present what God says, the truth of that, they know it with certainty that they know everything about everything else too. Like air conditioning, church vans, and how to do everything else. And they start to become dogmatic and unbending when their opinion in non-biblical areas comes up. Secondly, what about those that are serving? Now, how can they do anything to abuse it? Well, let me give you a couple. Uh, I've seen people that have wanted to, they'll serve they'll, until they drop over dead. But the problem is twofold. Number one, they don't know how to say no. They'll serve anybody and get so diverse and so distracted that they're exhausted. And other people are not getting the opportunity to serve. And then that, at the same time, there are some that want to be recognized. And if you don't recognize them, by, by the way, that's a dangerous person to work with, where they want to have that public acclaim for what they did. They may have the gift of serving, but that's the abuse of it. Thirdly, the gift of teaching. You say, how could you abuse that wonderful gift? Well, there's a verse that talks about ever learning but never coming to any practical benefit. Learn, 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 learn. Never apply. Never practical. Never use it to serve the other people in the body. Well, sure, you've learned a lot, but how are you serving Christ in this body? Or you'll get people that are off on weird doctrines. Oh, I've seen them come and go. When I was at Tri-City, I would see them come and go. They had some pet doctrine or issue. You ever have issue peoples that come, people that come to church where they've got a certain issue and they're always beating a drum for that issue? 
They may have the gift of teaching, but they are abusing it by what they're doing too dogmatic or too picky on everything. You ever see those picky people? Every church has them, by the way. What about the person with the gift of encouragement? How could you ever go wrong with that? Well, let me give you one way. Have you ever encouraged somebody that's really struggling, and the reason they're struggling is because they are sinning? They aren't treating their spouse the way they should be treating their spouse. They aren't using their money as God would want them to use their money, their head over heels in debt. They haven't been good parents to their kids, and their kids are running totally out of control. And a dear person with a gift of encouragement says, you know, it's all right, honey, you know, God will take care of this. I just want to encourage you. Meanwhile, the guy with the gift of prophecy is saying, I'm not here to encourage you, I'm here to straighten you out. And sometimes the people with the gift of encouragement encourage when they should not encourage. What about giving? Wonderful gift. And by the way, it does, you can have the gift of giving and not have a lot of money. Did you know that? But you just instinctively know that something needs to be done for a certain person. You just know that. And oftentimes there are small, non-monetary things that somebody gives to them. And they never tire of it. Other people are, have good wealth and God just continues to provide them money, but they're generous and they give it away. What about abusing it? Well... What if it comes in with strings attached into the local church? Or, have you ever seen somebody that because they are... It's dangerous when a church only has one or two large donors. It it, it is. And, And it might be good if those two people, are one or two people, are really godly in how they use the gift of giving. But I've seen churches where individuals will try to control the direction of the church through their giving or the strings come attached to it or they're stingy in their giving. Okay? Number, whatever number this is, ruling, that'd be number six. Somebody that's got this gift of administration, uh, what does that look like? Well, it can be abused if, if it's all about results and not about relationships where everything is task oriented. We will get this done. And people lie in devastation behind them as they move through it. Or they ignore the feelings of the people. Or they become dictatorial in how they do it. I'm in charge. I'm in charge. And here's how we're going to do it. And they don't listen to people. They've abused their gift. What about mercy? You say, now how can those sweet, special groups of people who have this gift of mercy, how do they mess up? Sometimes they carry the offense of another person. What do I mean by that? Somebody has been hurt. And they feel, the people with mercy, man, they feel the pain just like the person they're there with. They can internalize that. And things may get remedied for that other person, but the person with the gift of mercy is on some crusade now to get even with the people that hurt that person. And that's the abuse of the gift of mercy. Now, the question is, Now, I've given you some, it's not like taking a spiritual gifts inventory. I had to do that this week, by the way. I'm helping a guy get his his, uh, dissertation done, and they're looking at churches where the pastor has led them through a revitalizing. And they're trying to figure out, is there a certain spiritual gift, certain temperament, the DISC, D-I-S-C test, you know, what, what does that person look like? And so going through this thing on spiritual gifts... I don't think it's as hard as we necessarily make it. If you walk out of here and you don't know what your spiritual gift is, and we need to have you take a spiritual gifts inventory, we'll get you that test, the same one I took, and have you do it. We'll figure out how to make that happen. I, could, I took it online, by the way, and immediately you get the results on it. But it's important that you know, two things that are important, know what your gift is, and number two, that you use it. That you use it. One out of two is not good enough. Not good enough. Oh, so here's my last point. You say, now, you didn't answer a lot of the questions I have. What about tongues? What about healings today? Tongues today. What about 
the signs and gifts that the apostles had? Those are really good questions. Now, that's not my goal this morning. I've got an entire study on 1 Corinthians that deals with every one of those. Do I believe that they are the norm for today? Let me just see if I can simplify it. No, I don't believe they are the norm for today. I don't. Should we say that all of them are not from God? I, you know, it's interesting. When Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he said, don't seek these gifts. You know, the greatest thing is this love and, and various other things. Don't seek them. But when he closes the passage, he says, but forbid not. In other words, what I'm hearing him say, God can still use it. I, I talk about an incident when I was at Tri-City, and it was right after uh, East Germany got opened up, and one of the ladies had her mother visiting from East Germany for the first time, spoke no English whatsoever. It was Easter Sunday morning. And I remember the two of them coming up to me after the service. And, and you need to know, I listened to the tape. I spoke all English that morning. And she said, my mother was just electrified because she understood everything you said this morning. Oh. Well, that sounds a little bit like Pentecost in tongues, doesn't it? And you, so people ask, have you ever spoken tongues? Well, I haven't spoken in other languages, although it would be nice if God could teach me how to do Spanish a little easier than the way I'm doing it. But God, God can do things. God doesn't miraculously heal in a normal manner today, but he still does when it fits his purposes. The apostles, they call them apostolic gifts, they had gifts that were similar to what Jesus did so that the people, when they saw the apostles doing the miracles of Jesus, said he, they must speak for Jesus because they're doing just what he did. It was for verification. When the tongues came, it's interesting, there are three big times. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament Christians, and then the Old Testament Jews. And, you know, bringing the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Old Testament people in, and they all had that same sign. But that was 2,000 years ago. And that's not God's norm today. And God lays out some very strict guidelines on what biblical tongues are. And I won't preach on it this morning, but I have. And we need to look at always God's word. Well, distinctions. They're different, they're specific, they're temporary. Right, let me just get down to the core of this. Final statement. It's interesting in our summary to look at who God chooses to use. I'm surprised he chose to use me. And, and yet, he would have gifted me to do something. He might have given me the gift of mercy. He didn't. Um, the gift of giving. No, he didn't give me that one either. And yet the declaration of the truth of God, prophecy, if you will, I don't have new revelation from God, but man, I love to preach the revelation we have. You say, were you qualified? When I look at my life, I certainly was not the most qualified guy to do that. But here's the statement, and listen to this very clearly. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. And when God has called you to do something, you have to trust that he has empowered you to get it done. I look at the people that God used. What, what a cast of characters. And, and when I start Luke, we're going to look at all of, the, all of what was swirling during the birth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at people. We're going to look at people like Zechariah, Elizabeth, Simeon, old Anna in the temple. We're going to look at those shepherd boys, the three wise men. We're going to look at the Joseph and Mary. It's, it, God works through people. And when I look at the people that God used greatly, he had Jacob, but Jacob was a cheater. He used Peter, but Peter had a temper and a lot of other problems. He used David. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah tried to run from God. Paul was a murderer in his heart. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was depressed. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was too short. 
Abraham was too old, and Lazarus was too dead. Now, those are the kind of people. When we go through Luke, eventually, our, our second or third series, we'll break it into series, is the 12 people he called, the dirty dozen, if you will, the disciples. And we're going to look at those 12. I'm going to try to show you what their spiritual gift was, what their temperament was, and I'm going to show you their shortcomings, too. Because they're just like us, and we, we tend to think of saints as these, these wonderful people with halos around their heads on stained glass windows. And by the way, I need to talk to that church about the timing of their bell, don't I? I don't, it's just, it, it enhances the atmosphere. Maybe it's time to quit. Maybe that's what they're telling me. But here, let me just close this up. Did you get it? God qualifies the called, he doesn't call the qualified. And so if you're sitting here this morning saying, Rick, that's all well and good for those people that are, that are really good and really talented and really, you know what, he calls us all. The question is, where are you going to use it? This week, if you cannot come to some concept of what your spiritual gift is, call the office. I, I've, got a, I've got a thing you can fill out, or I'll get a copy for you so that we can send you through an inventory to find out what your spiritual gift is. And so this week, if you can make this commitment, God, I want to know what my spiritual gift is, and God, I am going to use it, now show me where. Show me where. And then watch for those doors around you. And just start looking through and say, God, where do you want to use me? Well, some people worry about ability. God is more concerned about availability than ability. When I look at this congregation, I'm going to close it with 2 Timothy 1.6. He reminded Timothy, Timothy had let his gift really get faint. And so he said this, For this reason, Paul talking to Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. For God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but God gave us a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. That's us. Next week you're going to say, well, don't we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, you do, and next week we're going to explain about that. Father, I thank you for the wonderful opportunity to present your word. I pray that each person here as they leave will grapple this week, today, with the question of what their spiritual gift is. I don't mean to oversimplify this, Lord, and I know there's a lot of nuance that can be put into this in a lot of circumstances, but one of the first questions needs to be, what am I primarily gifted at? And Father, I believe that a person will be most successful if they will focus on that area of giftedness. I pray, Father, that in addition, they might look around you themselves as we present life groups, as we present the ministries of this church, as we present life care and all of the people that are needed for that. And as they start to hear about this the next week or two, I pray, Father, that you will clearly direct them to one of those ministries. For those that are here this morning whose gifts have grown a little bit faint, they've been discouraged, they've been hurt in ministry. And Father, ministry is tough at times. And even though we know we're supposed to love and care for each other, sometimes we don't treat each other well, and some people are here this morning and, and they've been burned, and they're cynical, they're skeptical, and they're afraid. But you didn't give us a power, the, the spirit of fear. You gave us the spirit of power. And Father, I pray that this morning they might once again take that chance to say to you, I'm here, I'm available, Lord, use me. We ask these things in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ.